Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Today I'd like to talk about numerically linearizing a dynamic system. And maybe let's break this title down a little bit before we really jump into it. So hopefully the dynamic system portion of this is fairly familiar to those of you who've been watching the video series so far, right? I have some kind of dynamic system which has an input uh, vector of u. So these are all the inputs that go into the system. And then the system through some set of dynamics then uh, those u inputs influence or in introduce some kind of a change in the states X, right? Now typically this relationship here is nonlinear in the sense that the relationship between the states and the control inputs, the most famous and most common form of that, the equations that would govern this are basically a set of differential equations, right, which looks something like this, right, in a very generic form. Okay, this is also maybe well, let's put another one more de descriptor on this. This is an explicit form of uh, first order differential equations. It's explicit in the sense that you're able to solve for the term x dot. Okay, so we basically have x dot is equal to some nonlinear function of the states and the controls, right? So here's my dynamic system. And now it's nonlinear because this f term, right? This could be really anything, you know, that you're, you can imagine, right? This f could be describing an aircraft, a, uh, a simple pendulum, a cart, um, a set of uh, virus dynamics, you know, it could really be anything, right? It's very generic. Now, what I want to do here, let's move back the title, I want to linearize this. So I want to be able to, through some process called linearization, I want to be able to turn this nonlinear kind of complicated model into a somewhat simpler model, okay? And in fact, I want this to be a linear now dynamic system, okay? So now this thing has inputs of delta u, right, which is the perturbations from some uh, trim point. And this then through a similar set of linear dynamics would influence some set of changes delta x, right, which again represent perturbations from a trim point. And the relationship here, now I want this to be a linear relationship in the sense that I would like to get a set of first order differential equations which look like delta x dot is equal to a delta x plus b delta u. Right? So this here is my linear, your familiar linear time invariant uh, system, right? An LTI system, okay? So that's the process, right? That's what linearization does. It says you take some nonlinear dynamic system, you find some kind of a trim point, and then we're gonna linearize that about that system, about that trim point to yield a linear dynamic system, right? Now, the last part of this title is this adverb here in the front numerically, right? So what I wanna look at today is this linearization process, um, we've talked about this before. Normally, the way this is done is this is an analytical process in the sense that you basically compute a whole bunch of Jacobian matrices, you take the partials of f with respect to x, you take the partials of f with respect to u, and you go through this rigmarole of linearization by basically analytically calculating a whole bunch of partial derivatives. Well, that's fine and dandy if this f is easy to deal with and if you have an analytical representation. I want to look at the case where what if this f is very, very complicated, or what if this F doesn't even have an analytical representation? What if the F is like a black box, right? What if the F is a bunch of lookup tables cobbled together, maybe with some analytical derivative or analytical descriptors as well? But if this thing is just some box that you don't know what's going on under the hood, can you still take this crazy nonlinear complicated system, this black box, and turn it into a linear model? So this linearization process, we really want to put the adjective numerical linearization. Right? So that's the game plan for today. That's what this title means. It means take this nonlinear system and through some numerical set of tools, how can we get a linear dynamic system? Okay? So we're going to look at three ways to do this today. So method one here is we are going to be using a, a set of numerical techniques to numerically calculate uh, partials. And we're going to see later on down the road, I think, what that means. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with control theory, I think you already have an inkling of what this means. But uh, that's the first technique I want to look at, okay? And then in method two, what we would like to look at is actually MATLAB and Simulink have a set of tools to allow 
this process to occur. Once we do method one, we're going to have a good physical, mathematical understanding of what, of how you might be able to turn this into an algorithm. Well, MATLAB and Simulink have already done this, so we're going to look at MATLAB Simulink, and namely, it has a, a system called the Linear um, Analysis Tool. Okay, and then method three is. There's more than one way to skin this cat. And again, MATLAB and Simulink have another function called linmod, which will allow you to also perform this. So this is our roadmap for today. I want to spend most of our time looking at method number one, where we're going to try to lay the mathematical framework and the foundation for how you might be able to develop an algorithm to do this. In fact, we will develop an algorithm. We'll develop our own function to do this linearization. And then we want to compare our results with these two different other methods that are provided natively in MATLAB and Simulink. Okay? So um, with that being said, there's going to be a fair bit of background material that uh, where we've already covered some of these tools so when we get to that portion of the lecture I'll flash up the relevant uh, prerequisite lecture that I hope you've already watched but that being said um, I just wanted to, to warn you ahead of time that we're gonna move a little bit quickly in the discussion today because I'm gonna assume that you've sort of been following the lecture series up to this point and you're um, familiar with some of these but again if you're not um, what I will recommend is I will pause the video I'll flash up a reference for you to watch um, and when we get to that point in the lecture, you can just pause the lecture, watch the prerequisite video, and then continue on. So, um, all right, so if that sounds like good fun, why don't we go ahead and just jump right into it then? All right, before we jump into this, I want to talk a little bit about the implicit form um, of nonlinear ODEs. Okay, and what I mean by that is if you look at our formulation of our nonlinear set of, uh, of equations of motion here, right? Or our nonlinear set of ordinary differential equations, right? This is something you've probably seen before, right? Where x dot is some nonlinear function of the states in control, right? But I called this earlier an explicit form because you were able to explicitly solve for x dot. So when you were doing, you're writing down the equations of motion which describe this system, it just so happened that those equations of motion came out in such a way that you could explicitly and nicely solve and isolate x dot and move it over to one side of the equation, right? But that's not always the case, right? So in this form, um, uh, maybe what we should write is, let's just quickly write this down. So again, you have the normal kind of traditional form that you would usually see. And in this case, x dot, right? This is just some vector in Rn, right? There are n states, so there are n obviously x dots. And x here is obviously also an n element vector. And u is a m element vector, right? So there are n states, November for n for November states, m mic, uh, uh, mic for m sta uh, control inputs here, okay? But in some situations, right, you might not be able to explicitly solve for x dot. So a more generic form here, so maybe again we should write this here, this is the explicit form. But a more gen generic form of a set of differential equations uh, for a general system would be something like this. Maybe let's say f, big F versus little f, right? So I'm going to try to be very careful with my handwriting at this point. So little f versus big F. So big F here now is a function of x dot, x, and u. And this could equal zero, right? Okay? So again, x dot, x, and u, these are the same things, except in this case, maybe there were terms like cosine of x1 dot or something like that where you weren't, you weren't easily able to isolate x dot and solve for that vector x dot all by itself, right? So this here is, is another form of the, uh, of the set of ordinary differential equations, right? This here is sort of the implicit form of these differential equations, right? And again, there's not a big difference here. It's just a slight difference way to think about it. You can easily see that if you have an explicit form, it's really easy to write the implicit form of this, right? Basically, just move x dot to the other side. So now what you have is if I move x dot to the other side, you could write this first equation as basically 0 equals little f of x u minus x dot, right? So this thing here, this is big capital F of x dot x and u, right? 
So if you have an explicit form of the ODEs, it's super duper easy to write the implicit form. But again, in some cases, when you write your equations of motion, you might end up and be stuck here at this implicit form of the ordinary differential equations, right? Now, the way we can think about this is if you think about this, this function capital F, right? So this is F, right? The implicit form, right? What this thing is here is capital F of x dot x and u, right? So all this thing does is it says, okay, you have to tell it what is the x dot vector you want to evaluate it at. You have to tell it the x vector you want to evaluate it at, and you have to tell it the u vector that you'd like to evaluate it at, right? We already know what the dimensions of this guys are, right? So we said x dot, this is basically n independent variables. You can kind of think about it that way, right? They're independent variables. They're inputs, right? There's n inputs here. This is also n inputs. And this here is m inputs, OK? And what comes out of this? This 0 right here is if you think about this long enough, this is really an n by 1 set of zeros, right? You can actually see it right here as well, right? So this capital F, what comes out of this thing it should be, if you're picking x dot, x, and u's that are consistent with the equations of motion, what comes out of this thing is basically n zeros, right? So the other way you can think about this is if you don't care about what comes out, if you don't care that it, that it satisfies this equation, right? You could look at capital F as really big F is nothing more than some function where you stick in how many, how many independent variables are. There's n plus n plus m. So this is 2n plus m inputs. And that function maps it, or spits out, right, n items, so r, n, right? So that's all there is to it. We could just think about this big F. It's nothing more than a function of 2n plus m independent variables, okay? And it's a vector valued function in the sense that it spits out um, n Elements, right? The, the way you could explicitly see this is we could write this, right? You could say f of x dot x and u, right? This is a vector where you have maybe f1 of x dot x and u, big F2 of x dot x and u, all the way down to big Fn of x dot, excuse me, x and u, right? Where each one of these, these fi's of x dot, x and u, right? Each one of these small subscripts, are they're basically, these are now scalar functions, but there are 2n plus m inputs, right? There are 2n plus m inputs, and these little fi's, they map to just a single number, so like an r1, right? So it's a scalar function, but there are 2n plus m uh, independent variables, right? Okay, so if we're comfortable with that, let's do one more step. Um, I think I'm going to squeeze it in over here just so we can get everything on one page. Unfortunately, we ran out of room. Actually, you know what? I might be able to fit it in down here to kind of keep with our flow. So if you think about this, um, we could just, why don't I make some other vector? I'm going to call it eta, okay? Eta is, I'm going to stack up x dot, right? So there's n of these, these things. We, again, you just think about them. These are the first n independent uh, variables or inputs to the function. Then I'm going to stack up x, which are the next n independent variables or inputs to the function. And then finally, I'm going to stack up u, right? Something like this. So again, this vector n, this thing is just a 2n plus m element long vector of all the inputs, right? So if you do that, right, the beauty of this is we could now think about this function here instead of passing in, you know, n and then n and then m inputs, I'll just pass in this vector eta, right? So I could write this as simply f of eta. Right? So really, this <laughs> it's a really darn 
uh, easy, simple, convenient form, right? It's basically saying I have a vector valued function which has two n plus m inputs, right? That's all we're looking at, right? So all we want to do, and the, the thing that makes this interesting obviously is capital F, right? This thing is potentially complicated, it's potentially nonlinear and all that stuff. So all I want to think about now is if, if, if we're comfortable with this formulation, I just need to find some way to linearize or to come up with some first order linear or affine approximation of this function big F, right? Okay, so give me a second to pause the camera, erase the board a little bit, and then let's figure out how can I go about and linearize just this function which has two n plus m inputs. Okay, so what we're now going to do, the way we're going to linearize is we are going to linearize via the Taylor series uh, expansion, right? And we actually had a video on this, right, where we talked about what is the Taylor series expansion. And I just want to quickly recap the idea. Um, so the idea is, let's say that this, this function f is really simple. It's only a function of one variable, okay? So it could be something complicated, right? It could be some nonlinear function like this. Right? And what Taylor series said is that, okay, you can actually recreate this function, this complicated function, by picking an expansion point, let's call it x naught, okay? And then what I need to do is you could write the Taylor series expansion uh, of this function around this point, right? So I think what that said, Taylor series said that, okay, this function f, right, it's basically, um, a bunch of terms. It's f at x0, right, plus the uh, derivative of f, right, so partial of f with respect to x evaluated at the expansion point, x0, right, times x minus x0, right, and then plus the second order, right, df squared dx squared x0, right, the second derivative of the thing at that point times x minus x naught squared, and then I think we have to hit this thing with a over 2 factorial, right, plus yada yada yada, right, you went on to this thing for infinity, right, that's what the Taylor series expansion said, okay, so let's now expand this idea, right? And in the Taylor series video, we said that, okay, this was how you did this thing for a function of a single variable. Now, the multi, uh, the multi-dimensional version of the Taylor series expansion looked very similar. So now, this was the 1D case, right? Now, what if we have ND, right? N dimensions, okay? Um, or I guess in, in our case, maybe we should, instead of saying N, we really have <laughs> 2n plus m dimensions, right? Okay, so in that case, we had to, again, pick an expansion point. So in our case, right, now with our larger system of f of eta, right, is equal to zero, right? That's what I was trying to, th this was what we were focusing on. And what I want to do is I just want to look at the f part, right? So let's just look at the f part. I don't need to care about the equal zero portion right now, okay? So we said this thing, I want to expand this thing using Taylor series. So Taylor series said that I can make this thing equal by basically doing a very similar situation. So it's f at eta naught, okay? So again, this is now my expansion point, right? The place that I'd like to expand this around. This plus, uh, now what do we have? We have df uh, eta naught d eta right, times eta minus eta naught, right, that was this term here, plus, and all this other stuff, let's just call all of these things higher order terms, right, so plus higher order terms, right, that's what we had, okay, okay, let's think about this a little bit, okay, so first of all, let's look at eta naught, what is eta naught, so in this case, eta naught, right, again, eta was just my function of x dot x and u, right? So all I'm saying is I want to pick this vector at some location, which I'm calling eta naught. So this is x dot naught, u naught, and or uh, x dot naught, x naught, and u naught, right? So again, all this is is 2n plus m numbers, right? 
Now, again, maybe this is an interesting time to, to, to come back and say that, okay, right now what we're doing is we're just, ex we're just going ahead and trying to expand this function about some arbitrary point. You're free to pick this about any location you want, right? But that being said, what we usually want to do is pick a location of eta naught which is consistent with f of eta naught equal to zero, right? Because if we do that, then we're expanding about a point which is consistent with the dynamics of the system, right? Technically, you don't have to, right? You could just say, all I care about is this is expanding or creating a linear approximation uh, of this function around an arbitrary point, right? It's not necessarily true that any point you pick is going to equal zero, right? Um, okay, so that being said, um, we can still go ahead and do this, right? Okay, you pick some a to naught. Let's just analytically go ahead and expand this guy, okay, about this point. All right, so what we can do is let's actually go ahead and maybe rewrite this a little bit, okay? So what I mean by that is let's go back and flip out. Instead of using eta, let's go back and again, we said eta was nothing more than these three variables stacked on top of each other. So you know what? I could actually rewrite this guy, okay? So again, the left side is still f of eta, right? This is the actual thing, right? Is equal to f, okay, of, uh, okay, instead of writing eta, I'm going to write it like this, x dot naught, x naught, u naught, right? Okay, plus, okay, and now, here's where it gets interesting. This guy right here, right? This is a big giant Jacobian matrix, right? Of partial derivatives, of first order partial derivatives of every function fi with respect to every eta, like an eta j, right? So this here, if I were to write this out as just eta uh, or using x dot naught, uh, x naught and u naught, um, I'll just write it down, and then I think I'm just blabbering at this point, so maybe I should just write this, and we could say this is basically df uh, dx dot naught, x naught, u naught, d. I'm only going to take the derivatives with respect to the x dot independent variables here, this, and then I'm going to multiply this now by x dot minus x dot naught. Okay, this, okay. Plus, now I'm going to write, come down here, the second term. This is now df x dot x, oops, sorry, no dot there, u naught dx, like this, right, times x minus x naught, okay? And then finally, plus d big F x dot x u and all of these are naughts, right, du, right, times u minus u naught, okay, and then plus higher order terms, okay. So let's just take a quick look at this real fast to make sure we're all on the same page. So this guy in dashed blue, right, well, I'll tell you what, let's look at the thing that's outside the dash blue, this term right here. I think everyone will agree this is the exact same thing as this, right? I've just rewritten it again. Instead of compressing eta into one giant vector, I've just rewritten it out and said, okay, eta is really x dot, x, and u, right? Um, okay, and now the term in blue is basically the same thing as this term in blue, right? I just, again, expanded it and rewrote it in terms of each one of them. So again, what this thing right here was, this was a giant Jacobian matrix evaluated at the point of interest, at, at, at our Taylor series expansion point of A to naught, right? So this first term here, right, is that Jacobian matrix as well, but I'm first, I'm going to capture only the dependence of the Jacobian on the first n um, independent variables, which happen to be x dot. So this is really here, this is sensitivity with respect to variations in the parameter x dot, right? And again, this is a n element vector, right? Okay, then uh, I take that element vector and I have to multiply it by the perturbation in the first n independent variables, right? Which is x dot minus x dot naught, 
right? Okay, then this term right here, this is now what? It's sensitivity with respect to the next and uh, independent variables, which happen to be x, right? Which again is just n variables, right? And again, ooh, well, I, I missed a knot here, right? I gotta, I gotta make sure everything has a knot because this here, again, it's the Jacobian evaluated at the expansion point x dot naught, x naught, u naught, which is the same thing as the expansion point of a to naught, right? Okay, and then finally, this term down here, this is now sensitivity with respect to the last m states, which really is u, right? Okay, great. Okay, so that's all this is. This form is a little bit nicer to deal with uh, here because we can consider each one of these three, these are like sort of sub-Jacobian matrices if you want to think about them this way, right? But this is really, it's this one is measuring the sensitivity of the function, the big F, with respect to only variations in x dot. This one measures the variations or the sensitivity of this guy with respect to x. And finally, this third Jacobian matrix measures sensitivities with respect to u. And in fact, you know what might be more helpful is let's explicitly write out what do each one of these Jacobian matrices matrices look like, okay? So let's do that over here. Um, and I can erase all of this because I don't think we need the 1D thing any longer, okay? So, uh, okay, let's look at this first term right up here. This thing, df of x dot naught, x naught, u naught, dx dot, right? What is this thing? Right? So what this is, is this is a n by n matrix. And let me see if I can write this like this. Okay, the first entry right here, this is going to be df1, right? Remember, it's uh, the first um, uh, scalar function within the big vector value function f. This guy, uh, partial dx, Whoops, hold on. I want to make this clean, sorry. dx dot one, okay? And again, notice I don't have a bar on this, right? Because all this, this one, one element, what it measures, right? Is it is capturing the sensitivity of the first function with respect to the first independent variable, which another name for that is x dot one, right? It's not a vector. It's, t it's this thing is just a scalar um, uh, partial derivative, right? Okay, and then the next element over here, it's a similar, it's now df1 dx dot two, right? And et cetera, et cetera, all the way down to df1 dx dot n. Okay? That's what the first row looks like, right? So the first row of this thing is you just take the first function, capital F1, and all you do is you take its partial derivative with respect to the first n independent inputs, which are x dot 1, x dot 2, all the way down to x dot n, right? Then you go down here to the second row. So the second row, now you do the same thing for the second function. So this is now df2 dx dot 1, and then df2 dx dot 2, all the way down to df2 dx dot 2, right? And et cetera, et cetera, right? You continue this pattern until you finally get to what? You get dfn dx dot 1, dfn dx dot 2, all the way to dfn dx dot n, right? You take all those partial derivatives, right? So that's what you do. And then we gotta be real careful. Remember but the, this notation here of uh, x naught or x dot naught, x naught, and u naught, means you take all of these partial derivatives, right? This thing is, uh, it's, it's, it's also kind of ugly, but you evaluate it at the end of the day. Once you're all done, you evaluate this thing at a to, or x dot equals to x dot naught, at x equals to x naught, and u at u naught. Yikes, so that's kind of, 
Oh, that, that, that's kind of a mouthful, but that's what this ends up with, right? What you end up with at the end of the day is, let's look at this. This thing is a N by N matrix. Right? That's what you end up with at the end of the day. Okay? And actually, let me, let me scoot this up so we can see. Maybe I want to see if I can squeeze this thing. Uh, maybe I'll write this down here. This is an N by N matrix. Okay? Okay, so great. That is this term right here, checkbox. We, got, we, we understand what this thing looks like, right? It's this square matrix where it is just filled with partial derivatives with respect to the first N inputs to this function, uh, to the function big F, right? Okay, so now let's take a look at this one right here. So this next one here, which is, we wrote here as df x dot naught x naught u naught dx, right? What is this thing? Okay, so again, as you can probably imagine, it looks really darn similar. Okay? In fact, I can probably just sketch out the shape of this thing right off the bat. Uh, yeah, sorry, hold on. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's fine, okay. Okay? Okay, so this first element right here, this is gonna be df1, dx1. So again, notice there's no dot here, right? There's a dot on this term, but there's no dot here, okay? And similarly, df1, dx2, all the way to df1, dxn, right? And then you again, follow this pattern down. This is df2, dx1, df2, dx2, all the way down to df2, dxn, and you follow this pattern down until you get to dfn, dx1, dfn, dx2, all the way down to dfn, dxn, right? So you take all of the partial derivatives of all of those n functions with respect to the middle n. <laughs> so this is now, I guess it, it, it's it's, uh, maybe I'm blabbing too much. I think everyone sees what, 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 you're, what you're doing here, right? Is you take the derivatives with respect to x1, x2, uh, all the way to xn, right? Not the dots like we did above, right? And then at the end of the day, once you take all those partial derivatives, you end up with some, some ugly expression. You evaluate this thing, again, at the same location, right? You're still evaluating this, this Jacobian matrix at this particular location, right? So again, I have to evaluate this thing at x dot naught, x, everywhere you see an x, plug in whatever values for x naught you have, and wherever you see u, you plug in the values of u naught, right? Okay, so you end up again with an n by n matrix. Okay, checkbox, we got this thing nailed down, right? This, this, this second term. So the last thing we gotta do is this one. And again, it's not complicated. It's really darn similar to what you, we've got going on over here. So this last term, this, matrix here, right? I need to see what is df evaluated at our expansion point with respect to u, right? So again, it is just a matrix, right? Which captures all of these, uh, the, the function sensitivities with respect to the last m uh, independent variables Another word, name for that is just the vector u, right? So this first entry is df1, du1, and then again, df1, du2, all the way down to, now what's interesting about this is you end up with df1, du M, right? Because this element, this vector u, there's only m elements in this thing, right? This thing was a member of rm, right? Okay, so we end up with this. Let's go ahead and draw this guy out a little bit. Okay, and then the next row of this thing is df2, du1, df2, du2, all the way down to df2, dum. And then again, we follow this pattern all the way down until we end up with df n du1, df n du2, all the way down to df n du m, right? 
And then again, same thing, we evaluate this sucker at x dot, uh, dot equals x dot naught at x is equal to x naught and u is equal to u naught, right? So at the end of the day, we end up with something which is actually, this guy is not square, right? Those two matrices were square, but this one comes out to an n by m, right? There are n rows because there's n functions and there's m columns because we only have m control inputs, right? So we end up with an n by n matrix, okay? Okay, you know what? Let's give these matrices names so we don't have to keep writing them all down. Let's call this first one here, this matrix, I'm going to call this thing the E matrix. Okay, and then this guy right here, which measures the sensitivity of the function, how it varies with respect to the states. Let's call this the A prime matrix. Okay, and then this matrix here, which says it measures the sensitivity of the function with respect to the with respect to the control inputs, let's call this thing the B prime matrix, right? Okay, so if we do that, this actually gets a lot more simple. Uh, in fact, you know, what we can say is, you know, this thing right here, this matrix, I, I think we called it E, right? Let me just write a big E in here. This is just E. And then this matrix right here, I think we call this A prime. Right, and make, let, me, let, me, let me erase all this, my annotation, so we can just get to the equation. Okay, so I'm gonna get rid of this thing. Okay, this thing is A prime, and this thing right here was what we called B prime. Great. Okay. So, uh, all right, let's, um, let's rewrite and tell you what, let, let, yeah, let me, let me rewrite this thing, actually. Uh, let me rewrite this whole thing because I think it, it will make our life a little bit easier if we have a little, this, this laid out in a little bit better fashion. Okay, so we ended up with uh, what we said, F of, uh, of eta, right? This is what we were doing. This was with the function, and then our Taylor series expansion about this said that we had, uh, where did I have this thing? Whoops. Oh, here, okay, this was f of eta naught um, plus uh, e times, uh, this was x dot minus x dot naught, right, plus a prime x minus x naught plus b prime uh, u minus u naught. Okay, great. Or plus higher order terms, right? Okay. Okay, now uh, this is pretty darn handy. A couple things we can note. Um, why don't I move, whoops, why do I have a bar here? Sorry, okay. Um, a couple things we can do here. First off, if we had chosen an A to naught here that obeyed our or was consistent with our with our dynamics, right? So if uh, if A to naught was consistent with dynamics, what did we have? We had in the beginning we said that okay, that meant that it satisfied this, right? Big fat zero. So this, if we're expanding about a point that's consistent about the dynamics, this is just big fat zero, right? Okay, if not, if this thing was non-zero, we could move this to the other side. So we could write this as f of eta, right? Uh, actually, you know what, let's, let's leave it like this. This is maybe the easier way to go about this, okay? Um, okay, so this is zero, okay? What is this left side, right? In fact, remember, we said the, the left side, don't we have that f of eta is equal to zero, right? That was our, this is our original implicit set of equations, right? This was our original nonlinear differential equation. So this is also zero, right? So we could rewrite this whole thing as zero equals e 
times, and now let's look at this term right here. Let's call this, if you think about this long enough, this is basically saying how far away are these states or, or, or are these independent variables from my trim point of interest. So this is almost like a delta or a perturbation of how far away did you go from the point x dot naught. I'm going to call this, let's call this thing, how about delta x dot, right? Because it's talking about how far away did you go from x dot naught, right? Okay, similarly, this term right here, this is how far away did you perturb or how far did you move from the, the expansion point x naught? Let's call that a, a delta or a perturbation. Again, this is like delta x, right? And finally, this term right here, this is delta u, right? Okay, and um, yeah, that's, that's fine, okay? So this is e times delta x dot, right? plus a prime delta x plus b prime times delta u plus higher order terms in the Taylor series expansion, right? So again, right now, we've actually, uh, I can keep writing an equal sign because we haven't made any approximations. Of course, this higher order term thing goes to infinity, so this is not terribly helpful. So what I think we should do now is let's make an approximation and drop all these. So let's drop these higher order terms and uh, assume they're zero, okay? If that's the case, I now have to write an approximate sign, right? But now we have approximate, zero is approximately equal to e times delta x dot plus a prime delta x plus b prime delta u, okay? Let's go ahead and solve for uh, delta x dot, right? So move this thing to the other side, and uh, we'd have, what is this? Um, yeah, did it, yep, it should be negative, yeah, so, Actually, tell you what, let's let's move the other junk to the other side. So we can write this, long, I think I'm rambling at this point. So E times delta X dot is equal to negative A prime delta X plus, uh, minus, right, minus B prime delta U, right? Okay, now to isolate this uh, delta x dot, I just need to left multiply everything by the inverse of e, right? Okay, so if I do that, uh, yikes, I'm almost out of space, but we're, gosh, we're so close. Um, I tell you, what, let's come over here then. Let me see. Again, I apologize for the whiteboard usage space, but um, okay, isolating that delta x dot is now equal to negative e inverse, ah, uh, shucks, I'm running out, uh, okay, t sorry, tell you what, let me, let me do this down here, ah, uh, I, uh, I kind of want to keep this here, ah, uh, this is bugging me, we're literally out of space, okay, l let me see if I can, I can cr uh, cram it in here, okay, so we have delta x dot is equal to negative e inverse times a prime, delta x minus e inverse b prime delta u, right? Why don't I call this quantity here, this thing, this negative e inverse a prime, call that a, right? Because this is an n, an n by n times an n by n, so you get some other n by n, right? Similarly, let's call this term here, this negative e inverse b prime, let's call that another matrix b. Okay, so if you do that, we end up with delta x dot is equal to a delta x plus b delta u, right? And wha-bam, look at this. This is our linear system that we're looking for where your A matrix, right? So the A matrix is just going to be negative e inverse A prime, and the B matrix is going to be negative E inverse B prime, right? 
this, and again, I apologize that we crammed it in this little spot because this is the this is what we're looking for, right? If you look at this, this is your familiar linear time invariant system, right? It says delta x dot is equal to a delta x plus b u, or if you want to drop this delta notation, it just says x dot is equal to a x plus b u. This is our linear system, and what's super important about this is here are the formulas of how to get it. If we started with an implicit nonlinear um, set of ordinary differential equations, what we can then do is you go through these Jacobian matrix calculations, right? Here's how you get E. Here's how you get A prime. Here's how you get B prime. Then you just do a bunch of inverses and you multiply the things together and you basically will get the A matrix and the B matrix um, here. So that's the theory behind the linearization, okay? The next question is, we saw that all this hinges down to is it's nothing more than calculating the E, A prime, and B matrices. Boil that one step further. That is nothing more than calculating all of these partial derivatives. There's a lot of partial derivatives here, right? This is an n by n matrix. So I think there's what? There's n squared terms here, plus another n squared terms here, plus n times m terms here. So there's a lot of partial derivatives we're going to have to calculate, okay? So that's what I want to talk about next is how do we calculate all of these partial derivatives, right? There's many different ways to go about that. But as soon as we're able to calculate all of these partial derivatives, we we should be in business, okay? So give me a second to pause the camera, erase the board, and we'll be back in just a second. All right, so I erased most of the board, but um, I kept up the uh, description of the A prime matrix just so we have something to reference. So what I want to talk about now is, okay, how are we actually going to go about calculating the E, A prime, and B prime matrix, right? So we need to figure out how to calculate these uh, Jacobian matrices. Now, the thing that you can probably see right off the bat, like we discussed, is, okay, your first impression might be to say, okay, these are just a whole bunch of partial derivatives, so all I need to do is just go and take a whole bunch of partial derivatives, right? That's totally fine, and that's, uh, that's the analytical approach, right? You can just say, if you had an analytical description of all of the functions f1, f2, all the way down to fn, and they were simple enough, you could just go over to your favorite symbolic manipulation toolkit, or, or heck, calculate them all by hand if you want, but it's just a bunch of uh, partial derivatives, right? Now, what I do want to talk about is what happens, though, if this is not available to you. So what if analytically calculating these partials is not an option? So for example, the function that describes the, uh, the dynamics of your system, what if it's a very complicated function or what if it's a black box like we talked about where you don't have an analytical description? I can't fit this function to cosine, sines, exponents, polynomials, things that have analytical der derivatives, right? So in that case, we need to start thinking about how can I get these numerically? Right, so we need to come up with some numerical approaches to go ahead and uh, calculate these functions, okay? So the first way I wanna look at this is we are going to do this by numerically calculating each one of these individual uh, partial derivatives using um, a, a basically a finite differencing method. In fact, we had a dedicated discussion and video on how to numerically calculate partial derivatives. So that's this video over here. So uh, make sure now, if you haven't seen this video on numerically calculating partial derivatives, Pause the current video right now. Go watch that video. Make sure you understand it because I'm going to leverage that idea that we developed in that video right here, okay? So in that video, what we did is we figured out how to numerically calculate the partial derivatives of a scalar function um, of a potentially n independent variables, right? If you look at this right now and say if we just isolate a single row of one of these, Okay, so in I'm gonna circle this maybe in blue, okay? Just focus on this row of say the A prime matrix, right? If you look at this long enough, what this is doing, right? This is really, this row is calculating or asking what is the partial derivative or what is the sensitivity of this scalar function F1? So row one, right, is basically looking at, it focuses on only F1 one of uh, x dot x and u, right? So this function f1, right? So if you recall, we said that f1, this is just a function that has two n plus m inputs and it maps to a scalar 
output, right? This is exactly the situation we looked at when we were talking about how to calculate the partial derivatives of this scalar function with respect to all of its inputs, right? That's basically talking about numerically calculating the gradient of this function. And we saw we could do that using the symmetric difference quotient approach. So that's all we need to do right here for both the E, A prime, and B matrix, right? We basically are going to go ahead and, and do that. So if you go ahead and basically use the symmetric, oh, I keep spelling this wrong, symmetric uh, difference quotient, uh, right? What we end up with is we end up with an expression of each one of these entries. So for example, let's look at, in this case, the A prime matrix. So I'm going to write that down here. So, um, so A prime, the I jth entry here of this guy is, uh, what is this thing? So this is basically, it's DF I, right? It's the I, so the, yeah, the row is the Ith element, right? So it's this thing, D uh, X J, right? That's this thing, and this is here evaluated at the expansion point of interest A to naught, right? That's what this element of this matrix captures, right? So if that's what we're trying to compute, we can basically now say this is approximately equal to that rise over run formula that, and basically apply the symmetric difference quotient right here to try to, to uh, get an expression for this specific partial derivative, right? So if you do that, we see that this is basically going to be, the rise is going to be the function fi, right? The i function evaluated at, this is where we got to be a little careful, right? So now I'm going to evaluate this guy at x dot naught, right? And now I'm going to perturb x here, and we're going to perturb it in the jth element in the positive direction, okay? And then u naught. This, okay, minus fi Oh gosh, I ran out of space. I, I should have should have made this a little bit easier. Maybe maybe we can fit this all in. X dot naught, x i j minus, and then u naught. Yikes! Barely fits. Okay, okay. So that's the rise, and then over the run here is two times whatever the perturbation distance is. So here, delta x i j. Okay. Okay, so in this case, again, with the A prime matrix, all we're doing is we are only perturbing the appropriate uh, independent variable. So the appropriate independent variable, right? A prime is measuring the function's sensitivity to the x to the states, right? To x here, the not, not x dot, right? Just the states x, right? So in this case, we only perturb, if I want the jth element, right, the jth column of this matrix, you only perturb the jth state. So this thing right here, this x, uh, let's write it over here, where x uh, i j positive. What this thing looks like, right, this is x one naught, x two naught, all the way down to x j naught, but then you perturb xj in the positive delta xij direction, or, or in, in this direction by this perturbation amount, right? And this all the way goes down to xn naught. Okay, with this, and then I'm gonna transpose it, right? Because this, cause this vector should be a vertical vector, right? The, the way we kind of uh, interpret it, right? So again, all you're doing is you're carefully, you're, you're basic, this vector is basically the expansion point. All you're doing is you're just perturbing only the jth state by the distance delta x i j. Again, this is some small number, right? Okay, and then this other term here, the, the part of the symmetric difference, so this is the perturbation in the forward direction. I perturb the jth state forward by delta x i. This term right here, this, this x i j minus, this is in the negative direction. Direction, right? So here, x, i, j minus, this is again, it's very, very darn similar. x1 naught, x2 naught, all the way down to x, j naught. But now I subtract off delta x, i, j, and all the way down to x, n naught. 
and then transpose it. There we go. Okay, so that's the A prime matrix. The E prime uh, the entries are very similar. So let's write that up here. So here, E, uh, sorry, it's not E prime, it's just E. E, I, J, the jth, uh, ith row, jth column of this here, right? What that is capturing, again, it should be the function. It's the ith function, right? That's the row, again. This thing's dependence on x dot j. Right? And again, we evaluate this sucker at eta naught. That's what that element of the matrix is. So, trying to use the symmetric difference quotient, uh, quotient is basically saying I need to now do a very similar idea, right? Uh, it's, I need to evaluate the ith function at x uh, dot ij plus, right? And then x naught, u naught. This, that's a forward direction, and then minus f i x i j minus, and then x naught u naught. Okay, good, there we go. That's the rise all over the run of, again, two uh, delta x dot i j, right? Because again, this perturbation distance can be different uh, than that, right? And again, the, the this perturbation vector, this guy and this guy, Okay, let's just write them down. So here, so where uh, x dot ij plus is x dot, oops, sorry, x dot 1 naught, x dot 2 naught, all the way down to x j naught dot, right? And then I perturb in the delta x ij dot. <laughs> Yikes, sorry, this is getting a little bit um, uh, messy here, but I think, okay, maybe let me erase these, these arrows just so we leave only the things we care about. Okay, I got to transpose that. Okay, so that's a perturbation vector. So again, this is this perturbation vector where all I'm doing is I'm perturbing in the jth independent variable, right? So all I have to do is create this. This vector is basically, it's basically this thing, x dot naught, but all I'm doing is I'm perturbing the jth element forward by delta x dot ij, right? And then similarly, the minus term, right? So x i j dot minus is basically the same thing, x one naught, uh, this should have dots, x two naught dot, da 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 da, all the way to x, dot j naught minus delta x i j dot da 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 x n naught dot yikes yuck transpose okay <laughs> sorry that got a little more cram than i wanted to okay but there we go here's the e matrix here's the a prime matrix so the b prime matrix is again very very darn similar we are just going to apply the symmetric difference quotient to this guy so again the i j element of this guy is going to look like, uh, again, what it should be, right? Analytically or theoretically, this is the sensitivity of the ith function with respect to the jth control input, right? And again, that is evaluated about our expansion point. That's what this is. And then we apply the symmetric difference quotient, okay? So we need to now perturb the function, the ith function, okay, in the only in the controls now. So this, so these are, are, are the expansion points, but now I need to perturb the control. So I take u, i, j plus, right? I perturb this in the positive direction, and then minus the function evaluated at, again, the expansion point almost. And then here's u, i, j minus. Okay, so there we go. There's our rise. Over our run is a very similar expression, two times delta u i j. Okay, great, and then just for completeness, let's write down exactly what is the perturbation vectors here. It's, it's gonna look very, dark, very, very similar. So here, u i j plus, all right? It's basically u one naught, u two naught, all the way down to u j naught, and you perturb this sucker in the positive delta u i j direction. And this now goes only up to u m, right? There's only m controls. Okay? 
this thing transpose. Okay, huh, almost done. Lastly, we got U I J minus, right? So this is U one naught, U two naught, all the way down to U J naught. Now minus delta U I J, all the way down to U M naught transpose. Yikes! There we go. Huh. So. This is basically the symmetric difference quotient. So basically, if you think about this long enough, it's just a few for loops. This E matrix, we should just have to go I, maybe we, should, maybe we should have written that. What are the ranges of I and J? So in this case, obviously I and J are, um, are integers, but I and J go from, so I goes from one to N, right? And J goes from one to N, right? Because I going from one to N means there are I functions, or sorry, N functions, right? Here's one, two, well, I guess I'm pointing at the wrong thing, but I think you get what I'm saying, right? There's N functions, and J is how many of the uh, independent variables are we perturbing in this case? So there's N of them we're doing here. Now, for the A, I, J, this expression here, I also runs from one to N, and so does J. J also runs from one to N. Okay, but then the B matrix, we get a slightly different expression, right? So I runs from one to N, right? There's still N equations. So there's still F1, F2, F3, all the way down to Fn, but there's only M control. So in this case, J runs from one to M, okay? So this one, you would stop this for loop a little bit earlier, right? But long story short, this is how this is how you would get it. Um, and obviously, uh, the other thing that I maybe want to point out before we think about trying to how to implement this is um, we talked about this during the lecture on numerically calculating partial derivatives, right? But the perturbation distances that you choose, they could be different depending on the function and how it depends on each one of these variables, right? If, this, if the function has no dependence or a very slow dependence on uh, one of these independent variables, you can choose its corresponding uh, perturbation distance to be to be large, right? But if it changes fast, you have to make that smaller. So that's why we're using this notation for how all of these perturbation distances can be can be individualized, right? So you can make this thing, that's why I'm using two indices here, right? So you can use a perturbation distance which is associated with the ith function and the jth state, right? So this is, uh, it's sort of the most general ter for, uh, format and formulation, but in practice, right, just make all of these numbers the exact same small numbers, probably a good way to start. I mean, I wouldn't use machine precision, but you know, 1 e to the minus 8 or something like that might be good. So maybe we'll just make a quick note here. I'll just write it down just for completeness. Note, in practice, you know, using delta x dot i j, just make that thing the same number as delta x i j, which should be the same number as delta u i j, right? Just make them some small number. And I'll let you play with that. What is a good small number to get uh, to get reasonable results, right? Okay, so that's the game plan. At least that's in theory, right? We haven't applied this to any particular model. This is just the theory of saying, okay, we need the E, the A prime, and the B prime matrices. All those things are they're just Jacobian matrices, which are just filled with partial derivatives. All we're doing with this scheme here is we're just we're brute forcing it in the sense that we're just going through and iteratively calculating the partial derivative of every single element in this matrix using the symmetric difference quotient approach, okay? So let's jump over to a system now. Give me a second to erase the board and then how can we apply this to a, a complicated dynamic system? So the, yeah, let, let me erase the board and then we'll come back and look at an example. All right, so the specific system that I want to look at linearizing using this symmetric difference quotient numerical method here is a uh, nonlinear six degree of freedom rigid body aircraft model. In particular, I want to use this research civil aircraft model or the RCAM model. Um, again, this is maybe a time to pause. If you don't know what I'm talking about when I say the RCAM model, please watch these videos. These are videos where we talked about developing the equations of motion for this aircraft, and we saw that they were very complicated 
complicated. But that being said, um, we were able to build a MATLAB Simulink implementation of this model. And more importantly, we were able to derive and build a MATLAB function which uh, was able to uh, get all the equations of motion in explicit form and basically return the state derivative if given the state and the control. So again, all of that information is captured in these two videos. So make sure you watch those two videos and you have a good understanding of what this model does um, so that we can go ahead and leverage it, okay? So that being said, the aircraft model that we developed was uh, a couple of things. So the thing that we made in that lecture was we made this thing called RCAM model dot M, right? There was this MATLAB function where if you gave it the states and the controls, right, this thing would spit out X dot, right? This is that, that function that we spend a good bit of time developing, okay? So that was all fine and dandy, but we did say that this was here in explicit form, right? And you can see it's explicit because that's what this function did, right? It explicitly solved for x dot. So in order to use the, me the, the more general method that we just talked about, about uh, being able to linearize an implicit set of differential equations, it's really easy uh, because we already have this, right? So this guy is basically the explicit form of the RCAM model. So all we need to do is come up with another function. So I'm going to use MATLAB speak right now to define this function. So we just need to say something like function. Maybe I'm going to say uh, f val for the function value. And this is just going to be, I'm going to call this something different, like RCAM model implicit. OK, and then this thing, you're going to give it x dot. You're going to give it x and u. OK, and that's all this function. The function, I could almost make this in one line, right? The implicit version of the function is basically the function value of this x, uh, implicit version. It's basically what? It's basically you just say rcam underscore model. You give it x and u, right? And then minus x dot. Right, semicolon. That's literally it. So the function, it's it's a one-liner. You make this M file, which is literally, well, I guess it's technically two lines, but right, this is basically implementing capital F of X dot X and U. Right? That's what this function implements, right? And the way it does this is it goes, it says, okay, this is basically lowercase f of X U right minus x dot kind of the same thing we did at the very beginning of the of the discussion tonight right so this is basically the call to the rcam model right here right that's this and then all we're doing is subtracting off x dot right so that's the first thing we're going to have to do is if you build this this m file right this is basically encompassing the entire complicated um dynamics and equations of motion for this six degree of freedom rigid body nonlinear aircraft model so that's this big capital f right we basically have made a matlab uh, implementation of this big capital f function by leveraging all the work we already did. All of the hard dynamics were captured in this thing, this, this RCAM model.m, right? Which described the, the vehicle dynamics, okay? So really, the modification to make it uh, in a format that's uh, usable for our implicit numerical, sim uh, numerical differentiation via the sim symmetric difference quotient approach, it's, it's really d pretty darn simple. So we'll go over to the board, uh, or we're, we will go over and do this in just a second, okay? So, um, we're almost there, right? So if you remember, the goal of the, of the uh, numerical integration scheme is to develop and get, right? So our goal right now is to numerically calculate E, A prime, and B prime, right? And again, just to refresh your memory, right? So all the, the E matrix was, the E matrix was basically partial of big F with respect to the first N uh, independent inputs to this function, right? But this thing was evaluated at X, oopsies, maybe what we should do here is this is evaluated at eta is equal to eta naught, right? 
And same thing with the A prime and B prime. Maybe let me give myself a little more room so I don't crowd myself, right? So the A prime matrix was basically D capital F D X, right? And then this thing is evaluated at eta is equal to A to naught. And finally, B prime, right, is D big F D U evaluated at eta is equal to A to naught. Right? So all we're going to have to do with our, with our scheme is we're going to have to differentiate this function. We're going to have to do a numeric differentiation to get the E matrix, right? We are going to perturb these first n states or the first x dot independent variables or independent inputs to the function, right? That gives us E prime. So, he, or sorry, this is E, right? And then the A prime is perturbing this guy, right? And then the B prime is perturbing this set of inputs. Okay, the last bit that we have to do is we have to do this at a specific a to naught, right? We have to pick an expansion point that we want to linearize about, okay? So the specific point that I want to use, again, we talked about this way at the beginning. You want to choose a point that is consistent with the dynamics of the system, right? So I want to choose, uh, I want to put the vehicle or the, the system at some value of x dot, x, and u, which corresponds to some point of interest, right? So the point of interest that I want is this steady state straight and level flight. I want to linearize my airplane as it's flying along straight and level going around uh, at a specific speed. Now again, we had a dedicated lecture talking about how to find the x and the u and actually the x dot as well, how to find this value of eta where the plane is in this configuration. So again, that's this lecture over here. So if you haven't watched this video, again, take a moment, pause this current discussion, make sure you watch it and view that video where we talk about how to trim the vehicle and find specifically the x, u and the x dot, which corresponds to straight and level flight, okay? So I'll assume you did that and tell you what, let's, let's just write it down so we're all on the same page. So. Um, um, the trim x, maybe let's write this, here. well, we can start with the trim x dot, right? Let's, let's do that. How about x dot naught? What is the trim value for x dot? And that is pretty easy, right? Because this condition of steady state, right? We saw in that early video that in order to have steady state, you gotta have x dot is equal to zero, okay? So the, the aircraft is, the states are not changing. So this is a big fat vector of nine zero. So here, one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, there we go. That's x naught. We need now x, or sorry, so that's x dot naught. <laughs> Again, our subscripts are a little getting out of control, but uh, I think we're, we're, we're almost there, okay? Now, what is x naught, okay? x naught is the states at steady state straight and level flight. So I think in our case, this was, um, okay, what was u? It was 84.9905. And then 0, 1.2713, and then P, Q, and R were all 0, and so was phi was 0, but theta was non 0. I think this was 0 0.0150 radians, and then 0. Okay, there we go. Okay. So here was the state to get you a trimmed straight and level flight at around 85 meters per second airspeed, right? So here's U, V, W, P, Q, R, Phi, Theta, Psi. Okay, and then finally the controls that would get you that condition, that's U naught. This was, uh, what was it? It was a zero and then minus 0 0.1780 and then zero and then the two throttles were matched here at 0, .0 821, 0 0.0821. Okay, so there we go. Here's A to naught, right? It's these nine plus nine plus five values, right? So this is the trim point that I want to linearize about. We now have the, uh, the model here. And now we're gonna combine this with what we just discussed and we're gonna go and let's go ahead and jump over to MATLAB and see how can we write ourselves a function, right? That is going to go about and calculate the E, A prime, B prime matrices by doing the numerical, um, the numerical uh, approximation of the partial derivatives of each one of those matrices using the symmetric difference quotient, and we want to do it around this this point, right? Around steady state, straight and level flight. So, okay, um, 
that's the game plan. Let's jump over to MATLAB and see how we're going to write this, this function that will do this linearization. All right, so because we've done all of this work already, um, the actual implementation isn't so bad. So again, here's my rcammodel.m. This is the large function that we built earlier, which basically contains all the dynamics for this aircraft, right? So this thing is, uh, again, what we spent a lot of time on previously, and this embeds all of the complicated dynamics um, associated with this particular system. So then our RCAM model implicit function, like we just talked, about this is basically uh, yeah two lines of code right <laughs> in this case now RCAM model the implicit version right you give it x dot x and u and we do just like we did on the board right all you do is you take here's lowercase f of x u minus x dot right and this is the implicit version of those exact same dynamics now here's where it gets interesting I've made myself a function that I'm calling implicit lin mod this is what is going to do all of that um, calculating the partials of every single uh, of the E prime, the or sorry, the E, the A prime, and the B matrix. It's going to calculate this using that symmetric difference quotient technique we just talked about. So what you do is you pass this function a function handle. So we're going to pass it a function handle to uh, the RCAM model implicit and say that that's the function that I want you to interrogate and calculate the, the uh, matrices for me. Okay, so to do that uh, you have to pass it the point that you're interested in again so here we go here's the effectively these three inputs are eta naught right this is the x dot naught the x naught and the u naught so these are the uh the basically the expansion point for my taylor series and then what i'm going to ask for is like we talked about on the board is you need to choose and define what are all of the perturbation uh the perturbation distances for every single uh variable in every single function so these guys are also matrices of the appropriate size and all of them you know to make again to make your life easy every th these could be matrices of the appropriate size but they could all be filled with the same small number heck I mean if you want to you could just make instead of passing in um, three separate matrices like I've shown here you could just pass in a single specific number which is that small perturbation distance and you use that same perturbation distance for every single function and every single variable but again I've tried to make this general so if you if I wanted to per perturb different functions in different directions or sorry different functions uh, different distances you could go ahead and do that here using this framework so again that's the function prototype right you pass in all that information and now what it does is it goes through and rips through and computes the E the A prime and the B prime matrices okay so let's just take a quick gander at this uh, what it looks like so the first thing I do is I figure out how many states there are right you can take the length of either x dot naught or x naught both of those should be the same thing and then I'm gonna find out the number of controls by taking the length of u naught okay then all I have to do is uh, start going through those matrix calculations and we saw that uh, what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna brute force my way through it so let's start with the E matrix whoops sorry uh, like here so we know the E matrix it's going to be a ma an n by n matrix so I'm just gonna start here and initialize a container of all zeros and then once I have this container set up all I need to do I'm gonna write myself a double for loop so I'm gonna loop through every single function in the big F uh, matrix then I'm gonna rip through every single dependent variable well not every single one I'm gonna rip through all of the dependent variables of X dot here right okay so that's what the E prime matrix is right it calculates the functions dependence on X perturbations in X dot okay so the first thing I do is inside this double for loop is I extract the appropriate perturbation magnitude that I want to use for function I and independent variable j right so again i just pull it out of that that matrix that i pass in again think about this as just this is just going to be a small number right and then all i need to do is i need to make the x dot plus and the x dot minus or i think we called it on the board it might have been x dot ij plus and x dot ij minus but long story short this is the perturbation vector in the positive direction so what i do is again i start and we say that okay you're going to start at the uh, expansion point right and then what I do is I tack on I only perturb the jth element of that guy and I perturb it by the perturbation distance 
in the positive direction. That's why it's plus x dot, right? So again, I'll let you look at this code, and I think if you look at it long enough, you'll convince yourself that what at, at the end of line 22, after you execute line 22, this thing that I'm calling x dot plus looks very, very close to the, to the expansion point x dot uh, not, except it's perturbed only in the appropriate variable by the appropriate direction, right? And then I do the exact same thing in the minus direction, right? I start and say, okay, let's start at the perturbation at the expansion point, right? And then I'm only going to perturb the, the row of that matrix or the row of that vector, which corresponds to the appropriate um, independent variable that I'm trying to perturb. And now I'm going to perturb this in the minus direction, right? So this is most of the work. Once I do that, we can go ahead and evaluate the function at the positive uh, location. Now, what I'm doing here is the line 26 here is I am going to call my function. So in fact, in fact, I'm calling RCAM model implicit here, right? So I'm going to call that by passing in this perturbation vector. And notice here, I'm only perturbing again for the E matrix. All I care about is perturbing the X dot, those, those set of independent variables that are associated with X dot. So I leave X naught and U naught at the expansion point, okay? So this thing, this function, RCAM model implicit, it's actually going to give me an entire the entire function. So this f is going to be an n by 1 vector. Okay. Now, in this thing, um, in my double for loop, I'm going through... Um, uh, let's, let's think how, to waste, how I'm, I should say this. In this, in this double for loop, I'm, the outer loop is, is the function value. So what I'm doing here is really, this is actually slightly inefficient code, but I wrote it this way because I want to be able to easily understand what we're doing. What I'm trying to get at is line 26, if you think about this long enough, you're actually perturbing and you're getting the capital F perturbed in the positive direction associated with variable J, but you're getting function F1, F2, F3, all the way down to F9. So really, this is actually doing a fair bit of work here that we could leverage if you wanted to optimize this code. But what I'm doing, again, to keep this thing um, understandable and make it uh, fit what we did on the board, I am actually going to only keep one element of this. So I'm throwing away eight bits of information, and I'm only keeping one of them. I'm only keeping the one we're focused on right now, okay? Because I'm only trying to calculate row i of the e matrix really you could calculate uh multiple of them simultaneously again if you wanted to optimize this code but i think i'm uh, i'm belaboring the point at this point so i just want to say that that's what i'm doing right here i'm throwing away information that we could have used for the sake of understandability so this thing right here at 27 this is just a scalar value right this is basically f i at x dot plus x naught and u naught okay and same thing i'm doing the same thing for the minus uh direction right so the rise is basically this minus this right and you can see me calculating that right here here's the rise and then i divide it by the run so right here line 34 all i'm doing is i'm calculating that partial uh at location at row i column j and i'm calculating it via that uh, symmetric difference quotient approximation, right? So you see that by the time you blast through this double for loop, you have filled up the entire E matrix, right? Now, let's keep scrolling down and take a look at this. The A prime matrix, it's the exact same thing almost, right? So again, initializing a container, the only difference, right, is now instead of perturbing X dot, right? You're now perturbing X. So now I do the exact same thing, right? You start here at, at the expansion point and then you perturb in the positive direction and you perturb in the uh in the minus dire uh, direction right so it's virtually identical so i do the exact same thing calculate it it's stored in the matrix again so there's nothing to really worry about here it's the exact same thing then scrolling down to the b prime b prime again is also very similar again you just got to notice the only difference right now is w the number of columns of b only goes up to m it doesn't go all the way up to n it goes to m mike uh, m mike right not n november okay so again exact same thing so there's no need to really belabor the point i think you see how this works so this function you can see it's just a series of three sets of double for loops which are going to go through and calculate those three matrices
Okay, so now what we can do is we're basically ready to rock. So here's my script, uh, good old friends, clear CLC, close all. And then all I'm going to do is I'm going to define the expansion point that we're interested in here. So again, here's the nine zeros for x dot naught. Here is the uh, state to be in straight and level steady state flight. And here's the, tr the controls to be in trimmed steady state straight and level flight. So then what I'm going to do right here in line 45 through 47, you can see I'm basically, <laughs> you know, for all this work of setting up all those different perturbation distances, I, again, use the exact same value for every single perturbation uh, distance for all functions and for all variables. I'm using, uh, you know, 10e minus 12, right, some small number. And then all I do is I call my function that we generated right this implicit lin mod and i say go ahead and linearize the uh the implicit set of equations about the expansion point of steady state straight and level flight and basically use 10 e the minus 12 as a perturbation distances for all of them and give me the a or the e a prime b prime matrices once i get that i'm going to go ahead and calculate a the A matrix, as we talked about on the board, right? It's just negative E inverse AP, and then similarly, blah, 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 all that kind of good stuff. Then I'm just going to print them out to the screen, and then we're ready to rock, okay? So if I let this guy uh, go, let's go ahead and run this thing right now. Look at that. <laughs> it just blasted through, and it had no problem. Let's go ahead and look at the results. Um, here we go. Uh, well, actually, here, I'll tell you what. Let, 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 me, let me move this over, and I'll run this again. Maybe we can get A to f show up on one row. Let's run the, there we go. Okay, so here's my A matrix, right? It's a it's a it's a nine by nine A matrix, and here's my B matrix. It's a nine by five. So this is my linear system representation of the aircraft. Um, maybe before we leave this, uh, what we should do is let me print out E as well. And if you think about this, look at this. E is basically the negative identity matrix. And that makes sense, right? If you think about how we set up the equations of motion, because our equations of motion were able to be written in explicit form, you can see here's basically the negative identity matrix coming from right here, right? So, this is pretty darn awesome. We basically have gone ahead and we have linearized the system. This A and B matrix is my linear system of my aircraft about steady state straight and level flight um, at the condition we specified. So, uh, before we dig too far into this... Um, Let's think about this. Let's let's maybe look at this matrix and ask if it makes sense, right? One thing to notice is, uh, look at this. In the A matrix, this last column is all zeros, right? What that means is it's basically telling us that the function has no dependence on uh, whatever the ninth state is. And if you remember our state vector, right, it was U, V, W, P, Q, R, Phi, Theta, Phi, Theta, Psi. Psi being the heading angle of the aircraft. So this is interesting. It's basically telling us that no matter what heading angle the aircraft is at, it behaves the same. And if you think about that, that makes perfectly good sense, right? The aircraft should behave the same if it's flying north or if it's flying east or if it's flying in any different direction. Um, it should have the exact same dynamics, right? Okay, so uh, now that we've got these A and B matrices, maybe what we should do is uh, there's more than one way to go about calculating and doing this numerical linearization. So tell you what, let's, uh, let's pause the camera and let's talk about another technique to go about uh, obtaining the similar results. All right, so that was pretty exciting. We saw that that method worked in the sense that we definitely got an A and a B matrix, but now we want to validate that and make sure that we can get that similar results using different techniques just to make sure that we're confident with the approach. So if you remember, there's more than one way to linearize a uh, nonlinear dynamic system, particularly if you already have this in MATLAB and Simulink. In fact, this video, right, is one of our previous discussions where we showed how you can use two techniques in MATLAB Simulink, right? You can either use the linear analysis tool to go ahead and try to perform a very similar perturbation analysis, but have Simulink do all the heavy lifting and the work for you. So we're going to go explore that. And then we also discussed in that exact same video also how to use MATLAB's linmod function which basically calculates a linear model from a set uh, from a nonlinear system okay so if you haven't seen this video again you're gonna have to pause uh, watch that video so you can get all the content and understand the background and how to use this because what I want to do now is I want to basically use these techniques so we're gonna go really quick and we're just gonna apply these ideas to our particular system just to double check ourselves to make sure that we all get the same A and the same 
same B matrices using any one of these three techniques, right? The first being the one that we just did, that's our hand roll technique of using numerical approximations of partial, diver, der, partial derivatives via the symmetric difference quotient approach. Then method two, we're gonna use the linear analysis tool. And then method three is we're gonna use LinMod. Let's check those, okay? So let's go try method two and method three right now in MATLAB Simulink. All right, so we're back. I'm going to assume that you've already watched our previous discussion on how to linearize a system using the linear analysis tool and LinMod. So let's just jump right into it. So I've gone ahead and made a Simulink model that uh, is appropriately set up and instrumented for analysis using the linear analysis tool. Again, if you're unfamiliar with what is going on here, feel free to check out that other video where we discuss this in detail. So I'm going to come here to con analysis control design. Here we go, linear analysis. This is going to boot up the linear analysis tool. So we've got that over here. And now what I can do is let's just linearize this thing about that operating point that we already have loaded in and set up. And yeah, look at that. It, it successfully got something here and made a linear system. So I'm gonna drag this from the linear analysis workspace back to the MATLAB workspace. And uh, yeah, here it is, LinSys1. So let's check it out. This is what the linear analysis tool came up with. And if you look at this, here, here's my A matrix. This looks really familiar, and here's the B matrix. Again, that looks really familiar. You know what we should probably do is let's look at this thing, linsys1.a, and let's look at how does it compare with the A matrix we just calculated using the symmetric difference quotient approx uh, uh, method, right? So let's just look at the difference between the two, right? And maybe what we should do is let's take a, the absolute value of the difference, and then we'll look at the maximum difference across all elements, there and this is this should be the maximum difference in any element of the a matrix and look at that 1.5 e to the negative 4 that looks pretty darn good so i would say those two two techniques came up with a very similar a matrix how about a b matrix let's tr let's check b there you go look at that that's an even better um match so yeah this is looking really darn awesome um let's go ahead and also how about verify with uh, LinMod, right? So again, uh, I'm gonna assume that you've watched the video uh, that we referenced and you know how to use LinMod. So I'm just gonna go ahead and type in the command right here. So I'm gonna linearize the model that I have already set up. That's right here. Let me drag it over and show you. So again, here's the exact same system and it is set up and instrumented and ready to be linearized using LinMod. So when I call LinMod and I say I wanna linearize around straight and level, like that, right? It's going to give me an A, uh, B, C, D matrix, which I'm going to call A, L, M for LinMod, B, L, M, C, L, M, D, L, M. So again, let's run this. And yep, here we go. We got an A, L, M. And again, that looks very similar. So let's do a very similar check. Let's go ahead and compare the maximum difference between A, LinMod, and our approach. And hey, there you go. That's that same number, 1.5 E to the negative 4. So this is looking really good. Let's check the, whoops. Got to check the B matrix. There you go. This is looking awesome. So at this point, I think we've got ourselves a pretty good linear representation of our system, right? So here again is our A and our B matrix. So this is, uh, I'm pretty confident that this is the linear system about steady state straight and level flight. So now we're in a real good position to start analyzing the, the aircraft as it flies. We're analyzing this system that we've linearized around this point. Now that we have the linear model of the system, all kinds of tools come to bear, right? We can start talking about, you know, for example, eigenvalue analysis. So I can start asking, is the airplane stable or is the system stable at this location? Um, and all the other kind of fun things. We can start designing linear controllers, all that good stuff. So that is probably the topic, though, for another video. In fact, our very next video, we'll start talking about manipulating this linear model for this particular aircraft now that we're able to compute it. All right, so that's pretty exciting. We saw that we were able to use three different numerical techniques to get a linear A and a linear B matrix for our system. Now, that being said, we saw they all agreed well, but we were really kind of comparing numerical results to numerical results. So I guess I'm not terribly surprised that they all came out uh, agreeing with one another. It would be really nice if we could compare the numerical results we just calculated with, say, some analytical results, right? If we were trying to calculate those partials and those Jacobian matrices analytically. Now, we said earlier that the whole reason we went the numerical route was because calculating those uh, those Jacobians analytically were 
uh, somewhat, somewhat intractable because the equations were so darn ugly. Well, that's not actually the, the case for all the equations. Namely, what I mean by that is let's write down the equations that we were dealing with, right? We said that I was trying to look at this equation, right? F of x dot x and u, right? And all we were doing was we were going ahead and trying to get ourselves a um, linear approximation of this function about some expansion point, right? Now, we said that uh, for the RCAM model, this was just lowercase f of x u, right? Minus x dot, right? Okay, that was the, the equation. Now, this lowercase f XU is what we developed in the RCAM model.m, right? In those previous two lectures, we showed that this thing is kind of ugly, right? It's a nine element uh, vector valued function, but really all the ugliness lived in the first six equations, right? Because the first six equations gave us expressions for u dot, v dot, w dot, p dot, q dot, r dot. That was where all the things like the aerodynamic forces and moments and all that kind of jazz was buried. The last three were actually the Euler kinematical equations, which were actually not so bad. So what I mean by that is let's write this out. So the left side of this, okay, is big F1, uh, big F2, right? All the way down to big F7, big F8, big F9, right? This is equal to, uh, over here we had little f1, little f2, all the way down to little f7, little f8, little f9, right? Minus x dot one, x dot two, all the way down to x dot seven, x dot eight, and x dot nine, okay? And again, we said the ugliness lived in these top equations here. This is the portion, these first six equations, were the ugliness, right? All the aerodynamic forces and moments lived in these expressions. These expressions were ugly. In fact, we flashed them up on the, the board earlier when we were uh, talking about the RCAM model specifically, and we saw these were ugly. Now, these bottom three are actually not that bad, right? Because if we were to just examine the bottom three, Right. Let's just go ahead and draw a line here and let's isolate these bottom ones. So I want to look at just a smaller three by one element of F, uh, big F7, big F8, big F9. All right. So this is uh, big F7, big F8, big F9. Right. And that was just our Euler kinematical equation. Right. H of phi times omega b with respect to e expressed in the body frame. That's this portion here. And then I need to subtract off x dot 7, x dot 8, x dot 9. Okay? All right, so uh, let's go one more step. Let's write out what this H matrix was and what this omega B with respect to E is, and I think that'll give us a good example, and we can see what is going on. So again, the left side is big F7, big F8, big F9. All right, is equal to, okay, that H matrix, it's a 3 by 3, right? Well, maybe I'll try to just kind of delineate it like this. Okay, so it's a one um, sine of x7 uh, and then times the tangent of x8. And then this was cosine of x7 plus tangent of x8. And then we had a zero cosine of x7, negative sine of x7 and then a zero sine x7 all over cosine x8, and then this was finally cosine x7 all over cosine x8, right? Okay, so this was the H matrix, and then the omega b with respect to E, right? This is just times uh, P, Q, and R, which is the same thing as x4, x5, x6, right? Okay, and then finally we need to subtract off x dot seven, x dot eight, x dot nine. Right? Okay, so look at this. This actually isn't so bad. So for example, let's, let's look at the equation for just F8, how about? Okay, so you can see I can multiply this through and actually this turns out to not be so ugly. So F8 here is basically just going to be, uh, it, it, here it's this line. So I guess this zero is this. Okay, so we basically have cosine of X7, right, times X5. Uh, then minus sine of x7 
times x6, right, minus x dot 8, right? So here, look at this. This is not bad at all, right? This is a pretty reasonable analytical expression. So for example, going back to our numerical approximations, right? For example, we said that the E, let's calculate the E8, how about one entry, right? The E81 entry was partial of F8 with respect to uh, X dot one, right? Evaluated at some location A to naught, right? So you can see, all you gotta do is take the partial of this function with respect to x dot one. Look at this, I don't see x dot one anywhere in here, so this thing is zero, right? In fact, you can see all of these e entries are gonna be zero until you come here to x eight, right? So we see that really, e eight eight is the only entry which is non-zero, and basically this is df eight, dx dot eight, right? Evaluated at eta naught. Right? And you see from this, you basically get a minus one, right? So great, this is easy to analytically check the E matrix. Um, how about the A prime matrix? So the A prime matrix, right? Let's look at A prime, uh, again, let's look at the eight one element, right? Of the, of the A prime matrix. This should be DF8, DX1, right? Evaluated at eight and naught, right? So you can see, all you gotta do, take the derivative of this thing with respect to x1. Again, you see x1 doesn't show up anywhere, so this thing is a big fat zero, right? So you can see that actually um, the A matrix, the A prime matrix, the only place that this is going to have a non-zero entry is where, is in which columns? The, the fifth column, the sixth column, and the seventh column, right? Every other entry should be zero. And in fact, that's what we saw when we computed our, our well, uh, yeah, the A matrix was basically it minus E inverse times A prime. But you basically get what I'm saying, right? That a lot of these entries turn out to be zero. The only time they're non-zero is if the function has a dependence on one of the variables you're taking the, the derivative with respect to. So in some cases, it's actually not that bad to go ahead and try to analytically uh, verify. So in fact, the bottom three rows of the A matrix and the bottom three rows of the B matrix should actually be pretty easy to analytically um, verify. All you need to do is write these equations out and take a whole bunch of partials, right? And actually, gosh, just looking at this, and you know, in fact, you can you can pretty much tell that the B prime matrix, um, rows seven to nine. I'm going to use MATLAB speak here, right? So rows, the bottom three rows, all columns, right? If you think about this long enough, what is this going to be? It's the bottom three rows. So it's the function's dependence on you on, on all use right on all the use this thing is going to be um basically it's a big fat set of zeros and the dimensions it should be three rows by however many controls there were in this problem so i think there were five right because you see in this equation up here, I don't see U showing up anywhere. There's not a U1, a U2, there's no U's at all anywhere. So these are gonna, these bottom three rows are gonna be a big fat zero. So this is actually pretty handy. It's a good way to go about checking to make sure that the A and the B matrix uh, align with our, our analytical analysis here. All right, so uh, I want to summarize what we've talked about tonight. So what we've done is we've basically developed a system to numerically linearize a nonlinear dynamic system about any operating point that we choose, right? Um, and this is incredibly powerful because we saw there's three different numerical ways to do this. You can either use the uh, symmetric difference quotient uh, technique, you could use the MATLAB simulating the linear analysis tool, or you could use MATLAB simulating lin mod functions. And all three of them seem to give you very similar results, okay? Now that we looked at this though from this kind of academic perspective, and it might seem like we went into the nitty gritty details, I wanna kind of leave you with one, one small idea of how you can maybe extend this concept, right? If you think about what we did tonight is we linearized the system about one operating point, right? About trim, steady state, straight and level cruise at 85 meters per second, right? Now, you might have a system which can operate at a lot of different speeds, right? And a lot of different altitudes, a lot of different attitudes, a lot of different orientations, basically a lot of different trim points, right? So the linear model that we obtained tonight is sort of only good at one of these 
these points. Like, so for example, you might see an operational envelope of an aircraft, you know, spread out in two dimensions, like along Mach and altitude, right? And what we did tonight is we picked, uh, you know, some point in this operating envelope, like, you know, maybe here, here's where, what we did tonight, right? Here is 85 meters a second at some altitude or whatnot, right? And we got ourselves an A and a B matrix about this point. So now that we have this linear system, we could go ahead and do control design, we could do stability analysis, we could do whatever we wanted about this location. In fact, that's what we're going to do in one of our future videos is the immediately following video is we're going to start talking about how do I analyze the system about this operating point? What can I learn about the aircraft's behavior at that system or at, at that trim point, right? Well, if you move the trim point of the vehicle like you start flying at some other location, the system is, might behave differently. You might have to redo this analysis that we just talked about and generate another set, maybe let's call this like an A2 and a B2, a different set of uh, linear models at that location and redo all of your analysis. And uh, you can imagine doing this at different locations in the envelope. In other words, you would have different linear models for different uh, points in your operating regime, right? So this opens up a large variety of additional analysis of what we can do in the system, but now we've built the tools to enable us to go ahead and linearize the system about any of these points uh, in, in, in state space, right? Where you'd like to look at it. So I think that's pretty exciting and I hope you do too. So that being said, um, I hope you enjoyed the discussion tonight. And if so, I also hope you'll consider subscribing to the channel. Surprisingly, again, if you just scroll a little ways down and click on that subscribe button, it really does help me continue making these videos. And if you liked it, um, or if you didn't like the video tonight, please leave a comment below and let me know. I'd love to get some feedback. And also we can get a discussion going among like-minded individuals who are also studying this topic. So until I see you at one of these future videos, I think uh, I'll sign off for now. So I'll talk to you later. Later. Bye.